If you're new here today, I want to welcome you. We are in a, a new series called Endgame, and we began it just a couple weeks ago, looking at the subject of what does God want to see at the end of our lives. Since kids are going back to school, typically they get a syllabus, tells them what's expected for the semester, and what to plan on for their final. And in our spiritual lives, God has made it clear in Scripture what He is looking for for the final exam. If God were to ask us at the end of our lives, hey, did you do the thing I asked you to do? And we would respond saying, well, what was it you wanted me to do, Lord? The scripture is very clear what that is. And it's summarized uh, very clearly in a verse in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, the second half of verse 6. And in the New International Version, it simply says this, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Not this is one of the most important things. It's the only thing that counts The only thing that matters is that you become a person of faith and a person of love. That's it. All these other things we do are to equip us and enable us to to have a stronger faith and a deeper love. And that's what God desires in our lives. That's what he's trying to accomplish in us. And I want to share with you that that God is continuing to work in us to develop those traits. That's why we talked last week about the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. God has come to invade our presence to say, you're not on your own. I'm just not sending you out to to trust me and to love people, because that's hard to do. I am here to partner with you, to stir faith, to lead you in areas that will stretch your faith. I want to infuse your life with the love beyond yourself, that you can love people that bother you. You can love people that believe differently than you. You can love people that are even your enemies. I can do that through you because my presence is in you. So, so God doesn't want to just save us so one day we get into heaven He says, no, I saved you so heaven can get into you right now. My kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God's trying to do his will through us on this earth. And that will has to do with increasing amounts of faith and love. Now, I want to look at that first part of that verse for the next few weeks, just that the only thing that counts is faith, is faith. What what is faith? See, there are a lot of different views on what faith is. Most people say they believe, but is that faith? In the book of Hebrews, there's another very um, clear verse that describes to us what God looks for in our response to him. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Not just difficult, not just a hard thing to do. It is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So faith is necessary for a relationship with God. It doesn't matter how good you are, how much of the Bible you know, how religious you are, how devoted, how much you pray. All those things don't matter if you don't start with faith. He says it clearly. It's impossible. It's impossible to please God unless you start with faith. And it shouldn't surprise us because, honestly, it is impossible to have a relationship with anyone that's meaningful without faith. I mean, can you imagine a relationship with your spouse without faith? Without trusting each other? What what kind of relationship will that be? What kind of relationship would you have with an employer or employee if there wasn't a good level of trust involved in that relationship? What would it be like to raise kids who don't trust you? See, faith is essential to human relationships. It's even more important in our relationship with God. And the rest of Hebrews chapter 11, which we'll not go through today, just lays out case after case of people through history who had faith. Now, I love to go on mission trips. Uh, and in the last fall, I was able to go to Thailand with my wife. And I'm not a person that likes to shop. Um, if I shop, it's like hunting. You go to get something. I've gotten in trouble a number of times when my wife says, hey, I'm, me and so-and-so are going shopping. And I said, for what? That's mm. <laughs> serious. Like, for what? what are you shopping for? We said, we're shopping. We, we don't know until we see it. <laughs> and uh, so I don't, I just, that's not for me. I don't like to shop. Unless I'm in a pawn shop, then I like to shop. Um, sometimes Home Depot too. But, uh, but there, are, there, there is one time when I really like to shop. And that's when I go to, on foreign fields. Because I like to see what the market is. And the first time I went to Africa, I got to go to this great market in Nairobi. And all these handmade um, crafts and, and jewelry and carvings and clothing, spices, all kinds of stuff was, was just beautiful. And it was just like, oh, this new stuff you can't get in America. And when we went to Thailand, they didn't have a whole lot of handmade local stuff. They had a lot of imported stuff from China. And so you could get handbags, you could get watches, you could get um, 
uh, your phone accessories, you could get movies, all of which were knockoffs. So that's a big issue right now with, with our trade war is, is knockoffs. When someone has created something and someone else comes along and makes an inferior product that imitates it, it tarnishes the name of the original. But if you want the image of having a coach bag or having some product that gives the appearance, you know, I've got some fake Oakley glasses. They call them fakelies or folklies. I don't know what they call them, but they're... <laughs> You know, they, they, they give the image, not that I was looking for an, an image, I just wanted something I could look through and, and be protected from the sun, but some people like the image, and so they're willing to pay a little bit to have the image, not caring that the product is inferior. Well, you think that's a big deal in the business world, but it's also a big deal in the church because there is something that I would call knockoff faith. It looks like faith, but it, it, it does not have the quality of faith nor the effectiveness of faith. And yet many of us carry it around as if we've got faith when the reality is you don't have faith. You've got a knockoff version of faith. And I want to encourage you today that before you leave this place, that God wants you to have a real, genuine, life-altering faith in Him and not this thing that, that's created really in the Western culture where it seems like everybody says they believe in God, but that's not faith. Faith is clarified in this passage in two ways, two qualities of faith. First, it's accepting the impressive truth about God. What's that impressive truth? He exists. He is. God is. See, it starts there. You believe that there is a God. And I never struggled with that growing up. In fact, I was fortunate enough to grow in a home and in a community where faith in God was, was something that was normal. So I never went through a crisis of not believing in God. I've always believed there was a God. Now, I can't say that I've always followed him, but I've never doubted the existence of a real personal God. But that's not true today with most people. A lot of people growing up today, because the culture is not supporting it, and because often education doesn't support it, and often their own homes don't uh, uh, support it, that they question the existence of God. In fact, let me just quickly, I, I apologize up front saying, I'm just going to touch on some topics here this morning, but there are some main arguments that people use for saying they don't believe in God. There was a, a famous atheist philosopher named Bertrand Russell, and he was asked, um, you know, if you died and you, you woke up from death and actually stood before the God you don't believe in, what would you say to him? And here was his answer, you, sir, have given too little evidence. Pretty bold, right? Because there, honestly, there are some pretty reasonably signing arguments against faith in God. And the biggest of those is the presence of pain and suffering and evil in this world. How do you explain it? If God is all good, if God is all powerful, and God is all knowing, and he sees what's going on, and he sees how bad it is, and he does not intervene because he's able to, he's all all, he's all powerful. He does not intervene to stop it. I can't be God. What God would do that? What God would allow 911? What God would allow the Inquisition, the Crusades, slavery, abortion, child abuse, human trafficking? What kind of God would allow those sorts of things? Maybe more personal when you've gone through crisis, when God didn't heal that person of cancer. And it felt like God just stood by while that little baby died. When you went through some horrible tragedy in your life and it felt like God wasn't answering your prayers. What do you do with that? There are people who say that is proof there is not the God that you describe. This all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God. Because if I was God, I would not behave that way. Let me just pause and say I am so glad that we're not God. Because there are a lot of things that, that we wouldn't do if we were God. We wouldn't give out grace like God does to bad people, would we? I wouldn't do that. That's not fair. It's not fair. I'd give people what they deserve, wouldn't you? Problem is, there's something we deserve and we don't want that. So we like grace. And so this argument used against God is a difficult one. And I say it's, it doesn't hold a whole lot of water because if you go to the places in the world where there is a lot of pain and suffering, you will find people of faith. 
Why, why are they believing in God in the midst of their pain and suffering? Because the pain has actually drawn them to the only one that can help them in this situation. And the converse is true. In the places where there is prosperity, affluence, and ease, you would think, okay, if, if evil and suffering is, a, is, a, is proof there is no God, then you're saying that when there's good and ease and comfort, then that's a definite reason to worship God, right? That's a definite reason to trust in God. And yet you find in places in the West in particular where we are affluent and comfortable, faith is declining. There is something about pain and suffering that we don't understand that actually draws people to God. And I would argue that there are a number of people in this church, even in this room today, who turn to God, not in a moment of blessing and prosperity, but in a moment of pain, right? How many of you would say that? That's me. In a moment of pain, in a moment of hurt, you says, I need God in my life. So, so how can you say that that was, that was proof there is no God? It drew you to God. In the book of Isaiah, and some of you read this this week, Chapter 55, Isaiah says, from God, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. God is different. Here's another argument people use. There are so many religions in the world. How can you say that belief in God, your God, the biblical God, is the only true way? How can you do that? That's the height of arrogance. You're saying that all these good people that are Muslim and Hindu and uh, Buddhist and all these other religions... That they are condemned to an eternity away from your God because they don't believe like you believe? This is used as a a big argument against belief in God. This understanding that that it can't be that exclusive because that's mean. It's mean-spirited to think that way. Another reason why people argue against belief in God is bad Christians. Christians who are a bad advertisement for God. I mean, you go through history, and there are many examples of Christians who behave badly, like armies of Christians at times. And I would say that they were devoted Christians. They just, they just carried the banner of Christ. So the Crusades, the Inquisition, the Salem Witch Trials, all done in the name of, of God. And even today, we see hypocrisy in the church. We find pastors who've fallen to immorality. We find denominations. There's two major ones right now dealing with cover-ups of sexual abuse within their organization. And you're trying to tell me that, that Christians are godly people? They're as bad as everybody else. And here's the truth. Christians are human like everybody else, and they fall like everybody else. But sometimes we can be the best advertisement for God and sometimes the worst advertisement for God. And these are all used as arguments to say there is no God. Now, San Francisco Chronicle years ago had a cartoon of two atheists going door to door, doing their evangelism. And they knocked on the door of a man to hand him a pamphlet. The man looks at this pamphlet, stares at it, and says, hmm, this is a blank piece of paper. And the the two men says, that's right, we're atheists. Meaning, (laughs) we don't have a story to tell you. (laughs) We're not trying to convince you of a story because there isn't a story. We're here by accident. We're all just bumbling through the dark. There's no God above above us orchestrating things. We just came about and then we'll vanish one day and that's it. That's our story. We don't have our least story. There's no meta narrative. There's no epic drama unfolding on this planet. You're just fortunate to be aware that you're here. Well, that's good news, right? But what if God has provided evidence for faith? For example, what do you think of the intelligence and beauty in this world? How did that, that come about? How, how did it come about that, that when you look at nature and you look at creation, you go, wow, that is awesome. That is so astounding. How did it get that way? Did you know that, that this microsto- microscopic human cell within us that you can't even see without an electron microscope, that cell is like a little city within itself. Get a science book, look at it. There's production going on. There's a removal of waste. There's fuel. There's all these things going on within a human cell. There is enough information in a human cell to fill 30 encyclopedias. That's one cell that you can't even see. And all these enzymes and things, uh, chemicals, are aligned in such an order that they function now, if you went to the beach and you saw a bunch of boulders lying on the, uh, on the shoreline, 
You expect that. That's normal. But if you went to the shoreline and saw those boulders stacked in such a way they formed a castle, what would you conclude? Somebody was here. Somebody smarter than the rocks came here and did this, right? So when you look at nature and you look at the solar system, you look at the order and complexity, is it really random? Or did someone with intelligence come and bring order to the chaos? The Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. How about moral standards? The fact that we all believe, regardless of the society we're from, there are basic human rights. That, that's, that, that tells us that there is some authority above us that's, that's dictating those, that's presented those. Because we have a, we have a view within us that we, when we see something like murder, innately we see that was wrong. That's wrong. That's bad. What's interestingly, interesting is that you can watch a movie and see a killing and say, oh my goodness, that's horrible. And yet you can watch a nature show and watch a, a lion chase a gazelle and rip it apart and go, that's nature. Just getting food, just, just hunting for dinner. That's okay. But when humans do that, it's horrible. Why? Why do we feel that way? And why, do you, why have there been some political leaders who weren't bothered by that, who killed many, many people? Why is that? Why is it that Nazi Germany could exist and feel like it was a good thing to exterminate Jews? Is, do, we, do we determine morality by popular vote? By the feeling of the mass? Like, yeah, we agree with you. I think we should do that. We, we, think, we think this is right. You know, we see that in our country. Morality shifts, goes in waves. You know, abortion's wrong, abortion's right now. Is adultery wrong or is adultery Right? You know, is slavery wrong? Is slavery right? Is, is there a definite right and wrong? And within us, most people would say, yes, there is. Where does it come from? It comes from a higher authority. It comes from our maker. And we desire that. We desire justice. Without it, it becomes the law of the jungle. There's a series of movies that have come out. I've not watched any of them, but somebody told me about them, called The Purge. Oh. In the movie, there's a 12-hour window when the government says, okay, for 12 hours we are suspending all laws, anything goes. If there's someone that you've been wanting to kill, this is your opportunity. 12-hour period. No police will respond. No hospitals will be open for care. We are, we are blinding our eyes to this 12-hour this period. Now, can you imagine what life would be like without morality, without laws? It'd be horrible. It'd be the law of the jungle. Anything goes. But no, we don't want that. We want... We want morality, we want order, we want justice. Where does that come from? It's a good evidence that there's a higher authority. And then I would say the search for meaning is another major one. Looking for purpose in our life, looking to make sense of what's going on around us. Uh, there's something within us that says, I have, to, I have to mean more than a fungus or a weed on a hill. There's more to me than that. I, 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 I va I'm more valuable than that. Because I have thoughts and I have feelings and I have dreams and I want to do things. I want to make a difference. What do I do with my life? And so we we're searching for meaning. And I know people find meaning in different religions. But I would say in my life, when I gave my life to Christ, it was like, oh, I get, I get it now. I get what I'm here for. I, there's a purpose. And I'm living for something. I'm living for a kingdom that's, that's bigger than me. Now I know what I should be living for. And God gives us a purpose. Now, I would say that none of these arguments against existence of God or for the existence of God will probably convince anybody. What they typically do is support what you already believe. If you believe in God, these are great arguments to support it. They probably won't push you over the edge and go, oh man, I didn't believe, now I do. Or if you didn't, if you don't want to believe, to be honest, you're not going to be convinced because you'll find arguments to support your unbelief. And you'll, you'll hear the word evolution go, see, there it is right there. That proves there's no God. Because that's what you're looking for, a reason not to believe. There was a lady, her name's Cheryl. John Ortberg writes about this in his book, uh, Faith and Doubt. She had MS, and she went to see a beautician to get her nails done. And while she was there, she shared her faith, and the beautician said, well, I don't believe all that stuff about God. I can't believe that there's a God because of all the tragedy, all of the pain, all the evil I see in the world. I mean, there's this chaos. I cannot believe that there's a God. He wouldn't do something about that. Well, the lady decided she didn't want to fight, so she just bit her lip. And when she was done getting her nails, 
She went outside and encountered a woman on the street who was, uh, looked like she was homeless, had matted hair, very unkempt, smelly, dirty, uh, and, and she decided to go right back into that beauty shop. And she said, hey, beauticians don't exist. <laughs> and the lady says, what are you talking about? You just came in to see me. She goes, no, no, beauticians don't exist. I, I just went outside and there was this lady and she was all messy and her hair was matted and dirty and smelly. And she's proved to me that beauticians don't exist. And the lady says, you're nuts. Because we do exist. The problem is people don't come to see us. See, the problem isn't that God doesn't exist. The problem is we won't come to him. That's why there's so much tragedy, pain, and suffering in the world. We won't come to him. We must start with the fact that he exists. In Psalm 86, it says, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor there, no are there any works like yours. God says, I'm, I'm giving you evidence. I'm showing you. There's no one like me. Thus says the Lord, says in Isaiah, the king of Israel and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Tell me, who? Who's like me? Let him declare it and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. That's what God says about himself. So we believe he exists. But then there's a second part of faith, that, that because of this amazing truth we believe about God, we, we have this audacious trust in God. Because he says, if you believe he exists, you will dil diligently seek him and be rewarded for it. In other words, if you seek him, you will find him. It just makes sense that if you really do believe there's a God out there, or maybe you would say a God in here, that I would seek him. I would want to know him. I would want to befriend him, right? If you really believe that there's a God who made you, wouldn't you want to know him? That's the, that's a corollary to this faith. There would be this trust. And so the uh, book of Hebrews goes character after character from, you know, Enoch. And he says, Noah, Noah built this incredible boat because God called him. The God he couldn't see told him to build this great boat because judgment was coming on the earth. And he preached to the people and warned them. Why did he do it? Because he trusted God's word. And then Abraham. Abraham's told to leave his homeland to go to a, a new land called Canaan and that he would become a father of a great nation. And Abraham said, well, God said it. I'm going to trust him. Went down, settled in that land. His wife became pregnant, gave birth to a son named Isaac. And then God says, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. Abraham says, Lord, if that's you, then I'm going to do that. And he never did sacrifice to somebody. He went through the motions as if he was going to, and God stopped him. And Abraham was a man of faith. And then he talks about Moses and how Moses believed God when he says, I'm going to use you to deliver my people from this mighty Pharaoh in Egypt. And so Moses listens to the Lord, does what God tells him to do, challenges Pharaoh, and then leads the people out and comes to the Red Sea. And then he calls out to God, and God parts the sea, and the people go through. And, and the writer of Hebrews says, Moses was a man of faith. And then he goes on and says, David and, and Jephthah and all these other characters in the Scriptures were people of faith. Why? Because he wants us to not just say we believe, but actually act with trust. See, so often in our culture, we think belief equals trust, not necessarily because we have reduced belief oftentimes simply to an acknowledgement that something is true. So you can acknowledge God exists. I acknowledge that God existed far before I trusted him. I, ex I acknowledged he existed when I was three or four years old. I did not trust him until I was 16. You can believe without trust, and it really comes down to trust. That's why Jesus not only told people to believe in him, he said, follow me, follow me. See, faith kind of goes through a progression of, of there are convictions, these are, these are things that I think and feel. These are my opinions, my perspectives, my position, my stance. You know, this, this is what I stand for. This is who I am. This, this is my conviction. And those are good. We should have convictions. But Peter had convictions. When Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to try me, and then they're going to crucify me. And, Peter, and then he said, Peter, and you're going to deny me. He said, no, Lord, I won't deny you. Not me. In fact, I would lay my life down for you. That's his conviction. That's what he really believed about himself. And what happened when things got tough? I don't know that guy. I don't know Jesus. No knowledge of who that guy is. Went out the window. 
See, just because you have a strong feeling doesn't mean you follow up with that feeling with the right action. There's also confessions. Confessions are what I say. This is what I want others to hear that I believe. And so we sing a lot of songs about that at church every Sunday. We'll sing a song like, uh, I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit, and he's given us new life. I believe in the crucifixion. I believe that he conquered death. Uh, or we believe in the resurrection, and he's coming back again. And we sing that with great gusto. But I just want to ask you, do you really believe he's coming back? You really live? Are you living like he's coming back? Are you preparing for that, that time when he returns? Is the confession being followed up by our lifestyle? Or are we just voicing things? Are we just spouting off truths that we really, really don't believe? Sometimes we confess things simply because we want people to think we believe it. There's a pastor I knew down in Arizona, and he was a very big advocate of marriage and family. And he would actually bring in several times a year, like six times a year, He'd bring in Ted Cunningham to preach. Now, if you know Ted Cunningham, he's coming this fall again. Ted Cunningham is a huge advocate of marriage and family, huge. And a few years ago, this pastor was released from his position because he was discovered to be having multiple affairs within his church. It doesn't matter what his sermon said. What mattered was his lifestyle. It's got to go beyond convictions and confessions to our conduct, which is what we do. We may feel something is true and say something is true and want others to to believe something is true, but it's not until we actually trust, which would be entrust ourselves to, put put weight on that, lean into that. There was a man, scientist, very uh, up-and-coming scientist in his 40s who died this past week while he was rock climbing. He was 800 feet up against a, a stone wall, tethered to a climbing rope, and the rope broke. He tumbled 800 feet to his death. And you know what? That man had a lot of faith. He really did because he put all his weight on that rope. Problem is, the object of his faith couldn't hold him. And the point is, what you trust in is so critical. You You can have a little bit of faith in a strong object and do very well. For example... If you're getting on an airplane and someone says, oh, you know, I'm terrified of flying. You know, I don't know if I should do this. And you go in with just a little faith because you're terrified and you get on the plane. You got on the plane. You had enough faith to get you on the plane. You will get to the same place as a person who goes in casually and says, I'm going to fall asleep because I'm, I'm totally confident in the plane. That little bit of faith was, it got the same results as a lot of faith. But to put a lot of faith in faulty ropes will not help you. A lot of faith in a wrong God, a false God, does you no good. It will not save you in the end. It will not hold you up. We have to trust in the God who is trustworthy. Faith emerges when what I think and what I feel and say shows up in what I do. And we see this in this remarkable story in the book of Luke, chapter 7. After Jesus finished all his sayings and the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now, a centurion had a servant who was sick at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. And when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent him to the elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He's worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who's built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word, and my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. But get this. This guy didn't grow up in church. He's a Roman soldier. He says, I understand how authority works, and I live by that. In Jesus, you are the ultimate authority. You don't even have to come. You don't even have to come to my house. I'm not worthy to have you come. All I'm asking you to do is use your authority, heal my servant, and When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned to the crowd that followed him and said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Jesus was astonished at this man's faith. A little bit of faith in a very powerful Jesus. He he, he marveled at someone else's faith, but in a different way. He came to Nazareth, his hometown, and he wanted to do miracles there. But it says in Mark chapter 6, And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled, there's that word again, 
because of their unbelief. Unbelief. Like, you guys have all the scriptures. You guys have all the stories from your past. And you don't get it. And this guy just has heard it through the grapevine that I do things, and he believed it. And this guy has more faith than you because he trusts. He's willing to do something with his faith. Several years ago, my wife and I went to San Diego, and we, um, it was during the, we went to a conference, but during that time, it was our anniversary. And I said, hey, we are, we are in Torrey Pines. I've always wanted to go paragliding. If you've ever watched a golf tournament at Torrey Pines, you can see the, the paragliders along the cliffs of Torrey Pines. So we went down to this place and said, let's, let's do this. looks kind of fun. So we went in. They handed us a piece of paper that basically says, um, you might die, but don't hold us responsible. <laughs> I said, okay, looks like people are returning from their flight. Let's go ahead and sign us. So we signed it. And then they, they bring out these pilots. Now, so we're going we're gonna to share two-seater paraglider with the pilot, and, it's a, and they're young guys. And um, so I look them over. They don't have bandages or bruises. They're talking in complete sentences. They don't have alcohol on their breath. I think we can trust these guys. They've been on multiple flights. This should be good. And so they strap us in these, these, these uh, kites, big fixed-wing kites. And, uh, and this cliff, the, the cliffs of Torrey Pines are 350 feet above Black's Beach, which is kind of a comfort because if it doesn't work out, at least you're going to land on sand. So, uh, um, but, but for 350 feet, that may not feel so good. But then they tell us, okay, what we want you to do, and I say go, you run down the hill toward the cliff. Right. <laughs> Can we start an engine or pray that God brings the wind up? Because no, we're going to run toward the cliff. And so we start running. And you know what? It's hard because you're actually pushing against this force. And after about five or six steps, we're getting lifted up. And then we start soaring like a bird. And we go one way, go the other way. We're looking over million-dollar homes with swimming pools and golfers hitting chip shots on the golf course. It's just peaceful. It's quiet. I said, God, oh, this is, this is what it's like to soar like a bird. And we came back after about 20 minutes and landed on that hill again. And I said, this was amazing, amazing experience. Do you know what? Sometimes people call the step of faith the leap of faith. It's not, it's not leaping uh, with, with no knowledge. It's not leaping into the dark. It's just doing this. It's saying, I believe enough that I'm willing to let go of where I am to go where I need to go. And there was a time in, in my life, and many times in my life, but one example is uh, when I was in college, I was actually in graduate school and seminary, and after two years, God opened up a door to go to a church in Arizona to, to work as an intern. And I decided I'd never been to Arizona. There's probably cowboys and Indians there. I know there's a lot of sand, but I'm going to go there. And I went there to work with the church for a year. And while I was there, God opened the door for me to stay there. And I worked there for 10 years, found my wife, Julie, started our family there, and God changed my life. And the, the man who was part of that is actually visiting with us this week. His name is Steve. And Steve took a gamble on a, a young single guy going to school in Cincinnati to bring him to his church. But I just tell you, that was me running, running in a direction that had never run in before and letting God take me up. See, in, the, in Hebrews, after that 11th chapter comes to chapter 12, and it says, looking to Jesus, the, the, see, the author, the founder and perfecter of our faith. He says, don't look at the crowd. Don't look at the witnesses around you. Look at Jesus. Keep your eyes. See, it begins with a fixed gaze on Jesus. And if we can keep our eyes fixed on him, I'll tell you this. He is the pilot that will take you soaring. He's fully capable. He's fully able. He's done it before. Multiple times, hundreds of times, thousands of times. What are you waiting for? Why won't you step out in faith and trust the God who says he's trustworthy? He's shown us that you can trust him. Why not? Quit saying you believe when you won't trust him. That's not good enough. That won't qualify you. Without faith that trusts him, it's impossible to please God. And some of you right in this room today, God has been telling you, maybe today, maybe it's been for weeks and months, that there is an area of your life that you've refused to trust him in because you're afraid. Is it, is it, is it scary to trust him? Absolutely. Is it risky to trust him? Yes, it is. Is it worth it to trust him? Totally, totally. He'll lift you. He'll make you soar. 
So I want you to stand now. And I'm going to invite our prayer partners to be up front because some of you are hearing the God who's walking among us speak today. And I want to speak specifically to that person. Maybe there's multiple persons. God is speaking to you right now. And he's just saying, trust. And what I'm going to ask you to do, when we start singing, when these first words come out, is run to the ledge. Run to the cliff. Meaning, come forward. Come forward to pray. Don't wait. The longer you wait, the louder the voice is getting saying, not today. Not him. He's not trustworthy. Don't listen to that. Go counter to your gut feeling and trust the one who's trustworthy. He's here for you today. So as we sing, leave where you are. Come up. We want to pray with you. Step out in faith. Whatever it is God's calling you to trust him in, step out in faith today as we sing.